Today's gospel is that familiar story of the wedding at Cana in Galilee. Thankfully, thankfully, weddings in our time and culture are not week-long celebrations of feasting and drinking and dancing. But there are still dozens and dozens of details that have to be attended to and logistics to be arranged. The date, the venues for the service, the reception, arranging for the officiant, choosing the wedding party without offending too many of your friends, selecting the wedding gown and the matching bridesmaids dresses, coordinating all the clothing for the wedding party and the mother of the groom and the mother of the bride. I didn't realize that was such a big deal. <laughs> Live and learn, right? <laughs> Winnowing the guest list down so that it fits the budget. Decisions about food and music and drink for the reception. You know, all those details made me particularly thankful for two things. First, that Rachel and Elliot and their soon-to-be spouses were both gainfully employed and independent. They did 95% of the planning. So mostly, we just had to show up. And second, I'm thankful that I'm a guy. <laughs> Buying a suit and a couple of shirts was so much easier than shopping for that perfect dress. <laughs> Our family weddings, they hear somebody in the choir say, I forgot about the shoes to go with the dresses. <laughs> yes. Our family weddings deepened my appreciation of the, the social embarrassment that was staring the head steward and the bridegroom in the face at this wedding in Cana when they ran out of wine. The, soul, the whole celebration was threatened by this shortage. But Jesus, his disciples, and the mother of Jesus, you'll note that the mother of Jesus is never named in the Gospel of John. They're there among the guests. And there's a ton of symbolism in what Jesus did at that wedding feast. In this story, Jesus' brusque response to his mother when she informs him of the looming disaster, when he says, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Kind of surprises us because it's not very polite to his mom. But Jesus is just beginning to reveal himself to the masses, and his words point us to events later in his ministry when his hour has come. In John 13, 1, Jesus has gathered his disciples for their last meal together. And John, the, the gospel writer, sets the stage. He says, now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. And then after the meal, Jesus begins what we know as his high priestly prayer. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. And then there's the wedding itself that reminds us of the numerous images of heaven as a feast or a wedding celebration. The symbolism of the covenant of marriage that we heard the prophet Isaiah talk about reminds us of the relationship that God wants with humans. And then, turning about 175 gallons of water into wine announces to us the abundance of God's grace and blessings for all people. And then that symbolism, and when, we, when we remember that this is the only miracle where the physical form of something is changed, water to wine. And it connects with creation in the prologue there in John's Gospel. Where John wrote those beautiful words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. Well, all of that symbolism readily leaped out at me, and perhaps you as well, and we've heard and Pastor Ken and I have probably preached sermons on all of those things. But today I wanted to delve a little more into the impact of this sign on the disciples and what John might be teaching us for our lives today. You know, John, at the end of the story, summarizes the sign or the miracle this way. Jesus did this, 
the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. When the disciples recognized the glory of God in the presence of their rabbi Jesus, the presence of God in Jesus, they believed. The disciples were changed or transformed as they continued following Jesus. The lesson that kind of slapped me in the face this week is when we see and recognize and truly acknowledge the presence of God or Christ, we, like those disciples, must be changed. We should be strengthened in our faith to follow Christ, having our lives transformed by the example of Christ and His teachings. So in my devotional readings and prayers and activities this week, I've, I've tried to be more attentive to the presence of Christ. I was reminded that because Christ is God and Christ was fully involved in creating and continuing to create everything that exists, the plants, the rocks, planets, creatures, and people, the writer of Genesis announces to us that Every atom, every molecule of creation was pronounced good by God. And in every aspect of creation, God's handprint or thumbprint is present. The incredible vistas that we enjoy around here, the beautiful flowers, the amazing rock formations, the gorgeous sunsets, they all announce the presence of God to us in some way, shape, or form. And then the incarnation that we just celebrated at Christmas, God becoming fully human in Jesus, affirms that creation is good and loved by God. It's that steadfast love that endures forever that moved God to set aside God's glory, to come in flesh and bone to restore us and all of creation to that married relationship with God that's been fractured by sin for so long. So what does it mean for us as followers of Christ to see the presence of Christ, the incarnation of God in every aspect of creation, in every inanimate object, in every creature, in every other person? The challenging realization for me is that I, like the disciples in today's story, should be changed, should believe. In response to God's presence in creation, I'm called to continually strive to be a better caretaker of the resources of this world. Can I change my consumer habits so as not to deplete or, and to minimize harm to the natural resources? Can I change the food that we purchase to food that's, per, that's produced in sustainable ways and that provides a fair price to the farmer? Can I change my, my shopping habits to purchase from corporations who pay a living wage and who do less harm to the environment? In response to God's presence in all people, can I change how I interact with that other person or group of people? When we see God, we can't berate or belittle or, or callously criticize those with whom we disagree or don't see eye to eye with. For God is present in Christian and Jew, atheist and Muslim, Republican and Democrat, citizen and immigrant, gay and straight. When the eyes of our faith see God in that other person, whoever that person is, our base human reaction can't simply be to, to reject, to denounce, condemn, or persecute that person. When we see the presence of God in another, we're looking deeper than the superficial stereotypes society imposes on them. As we look deeper at others, can we see, can we see a fellow child of God one who's beloved by God, one for whom Christ died? 
And then dare we treat that person as a sister or brother? I'll be the first to admit that looking deeper and seeing the presence of God in others is a challenge and sometimes just downright hard for me. Perpetrators of mass killings, those who spout and encourage hatred toward others, foreign terrorists committed to wreaking havoc and death. Hard to see them as beloved children of God. But they're children of God nonetheless. So I pray for them. I pray for eyes of faith to see more clearly the presence of God and to work in a positive way and to support positive causes. Seeing how recognizing the glory of God present in Christ changed the disciples, it leaped out at me in this political, because this is a political season. And I feel, maybe you do too, inundated inundated by negative political ads and, and just incredibly insensitive pronouncements from every candidate for president about each other, about various groups in our nation or world. And for the life of me, I can barely identify anything that resonates with my faith in Christ or how Christ shows us and calls us to love and care for others, including our enemies. And that saddens and concerns me as a person of faith. This acrid rhetoric seems to me to only be deepening painful divisions in our nation and society and world rather than bringing healing, hope, and unity as well as sharing the faith we have in Christ. Now, you'd be mistaken to hear my words this morning as political. Please don't. Faith in Christ is just the lens that I use trying to discern what's helpful and what may be more harmful than good. My faith simply recoils at the vicious, divisive words I hear across the entire political spectrum, our nation and even the world. This rhetoric doesn't seem to me to be grounded in faith that recognizes the presence of God in others or this world believes in the incarnation which announced God's love and offer for grace and forgiveness for all people, doesn't believe or is willing to show that same sacrificial love for others in working toward mutual good. In seminary, the legendary story is told of the professor who assigned this gospel story for a sermon to his class. And when the sermons all came in and they were graded and handed back out, the class was astounded that only one person received an A out of the whole class. They were so astounded that they imposed upon the professor to have that one student deliver that sermon for the class, a very intimidating thing. And so the student went to the front of the class and began, the water saw her creator and blushed, amen, and then went and sat down. The disciples saw the Christ, believed, and were changed. If we see Christ in others, in the world, we must also be changed in how we act and speak. This is how we as Christians best embody hope, peace, unity, and share our faith with the world for which Christ gave his life. Amen.